This morning we're going to be going through John 14, 1 through 6. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up there. That's where we're going to spend most of our time. And, uh, Daniel read it really well this morning. We're going to read it again real quick. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it weren't so, I would not have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you also will be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus, the way to the Father. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me or no one comes to the Father except through me. So we've done a lot of this series to this point. So I do pop quiz time uh, in our I Am series. What was the first one? I am the... Bread. Okay, the bread of life. We do the charades, works too. Uh, second, second one was I am the... That would be a shower. Yeah, light. light I, am, I am the light. Uh, number three was I am the... Light. The door. Good. Doing well. Uh, then we had I am the... The good shepherd. What was, what was last week? Shower. I am the shower? No. Look. But it is showering. Anybody? Nobody? I am the resurrection and the life. Ding, ding, ding. One person was listening. Which is good. We've done all these things, and, and you know, Christ is coming through the Gospel of John. We get to hear all these great I am statements of Jesus proclaiming that he is pretty much. He's God. He has a divine nature. And through Him, we get a lot of great things. So through Him, we are sustained. He is our bread of life. We find our sustenance through Him. We will never be hungry. We will never be searching for anything more because He gives us all we need. He's the light of the world. In a world that is so dark, He brings the light. And through His light, brings life. He guides us through our path. He is a door to the gate. He sits his sheep in there and he sits at the door and becomes the door so that nobody will go in or out unless it is through him. He keeps us safe. He protects us. He's our good shepherd. That we, even though we are lost, he will go and seek us out and find us and bring us back. He leads us to where we need to be, not necessarily where we want to be. He leads us to what will sustain us and give us life as well. Last week was so great because Jesus is a death conqueror. He is the resurrection and the life. He can speak to death and say, I own you. And bring life, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. He gives us life so that we can live life to the fullest. Well, today is going to be great because we are talking about how do we get there? He looks at his disciples and he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. There was that question that had been asked, because I think we've been asking it for centuries. Where are you going? How do we get there? We, we're searching for things, and, and as people, we search for, in a lot of different places, in a lot of different uh, avenues to find that something we feel like we're missing. And throughout time, we, we've done this, so I, I kind of accumulated a few things from a, a book that I read. And so this is kind of throughout time how men has been seeking for that eternity, that salvation, that you know, that something that's been missing. So in Greece, they say be wise and know yourself. In Rome they said be strong and discipline yourself. Judaism said be holy and conform yourself. Epicureanism says be sensuous and enjoy yourself. Education says be resourceful and expand yourself. Psychology says be confident and fulfill yourself. Materialism says be inquisitive and please yourself. We struggle with this one a lot as people I think the most. Pride says be superior and promote yourself. Asceticism says be inferior and suppress yourself. 
Diplomacy says be reasonable and control yourself. Communism says be collective, secure yourself. Humanism says be capable and trust yourself. And philanthropy says be unselfish and give yourself. These are a lot of avenues that we as people have gone through and looked at and tried to find that something that's been missing. And as we get into it, and even if we enjoy it, we start to think that, yeah, this is the right way, we still start to feel that there's that something in there that's missing. That's something that doesn't get us over that hump that we've been longing for and looking for. And Christ said it so plainly in there. In the scripture where Thomas is asking him, well, well, we don't know where you're going, so how do we get there? Or what is the way? And Jesus point blank says to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to where you want to be unless it is through me. Because I am the one that gives that life. So there's another couple of things that, that people have done too. There have been other ways developed over time. Uh, ways to view life. Ways to look at the life you've been given and try to figure things out. And so here's a few that I, I want to read to you. They're not going to be up on the board. Uh, one is optimism. By looking through the rose-colored glasses, we can convince ourselves that we live in a fantasy island. That we exist under cloudless skies and that we're surrounded by oceans of love. Affirmation support. And there's only one problem. The, the lack of reality. Pessimism. It's easy to turn life into a, a grim existence. If something bad can happen, the pessimist is convinced it will. The problem is here, the obvious lack of joy. Suspicion. Suspicion is a deeper uh, trench than pessimism. Everyone is out to get you. You can't believe anyone anymore. And the major problem is you have that lack of trust. Fatalism. Fatalist says that we may as well accept our lot. Nothing can be done to change it. Just bite your lip and endure the end. If you can check out responsibility, do it. Stay uninvolved. What's our problem here? It's that lack, that lack of hope. Nothing to look forward to. We have all these different ways of looking at life and all these ways of, of trying to figure out what's going on with, within us and trying to find out where we need to be. And ultimately, it always comes down the same way. If we are looking in different places than looking from Christ, we will always be lost. So I'm going to give you a story. I kind of find myself as an expert of getting lost. There's some people in the back that have experienced that expertise of being lost, even with the GPS. Find good ways of getting lost. It's really easy for me. For others, it's kind of hard to get lost when you know the direction, but not for me. I get lost very easy. There's a time when I was uh, uh, 18 or 19. Uh, I think John might have been there. We were, I was going here, but I, I did some stuff with the, the Roseville Youth Group and would help out. And, uh, we went on a trip to Georgetown. We were going on a hike down to like some waterfalls and some different things like that. And uh, as we got down there, I was bored. So I decided, because you know that's, that's the guy I am, I said, hey, I'm going to go run back to the car. I was kind of bored. I was in good shape. I like to you know, run and do different things. So I started to run. And I got to a fork in the road of a trail. And I said, oh, that's right, I go this way. And so I ran for like two hours. And, and I would get to a point and I'd say, that doesn't look right. And then I'd get somewhere else and say, oh, but that does. I'll be honest, all trees look the same uh, after a while. And so I started to go off of landmarks and... I, I remember there was some water, so I'm just going to keep going. Well, it dead ended after two and a half hours to a waterfall, and I got there, I was like, Man, that is awesome. I went the wrong way for like two and a half hours. I was supposed to go straight. And so I turn around, and my genius self says, well, if I was supposed to go straight at the fort, I could find another trail that goes at an angle, and I will find my way back to the main trail, because that's what we, you know, I know the way. So I figure if I go in the general area, I'll find it. Well, here's what happens when you're lost and you try to get smart and not just go back to where you were. You start to run on that path and it turns you back to the direction you were going. And you say, I'm going to die out here. Because as I'm running in Georgetown, I hear things in the bushes and I go, and that's a mountain lion. It's going to get me. So what do I do? I run faster in the wrong direction. And so I finally get back to where I needed to be and still had another hour to go. So I was basically lost for about five hours. 
and it was about 100 degrees and I had no water. But I was in good shape, luckily, because I ran all the way back. Now here's the great part of the whole story, which has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about this part, but it's okay. Uh, my stepdad had just married my mom, and she was out of town. And so he's at the car stressing out, she's going to kill me, your son's going to die on here. But I found my way back. And, and it was great, because I, I found that there was a path I needed to be on. And I knew where the path was, but inside of me something said, hey, you know the way. Just keep going. Oh, don't turn around. You'll find it. You'll get there. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where we get stuck and where we get lost. And we always try to find our way to where we think we need to be. But we don't trust and rely on the knowing where we should be. Knowing that what we are doing might be wrong and we need to return from it. And instead of doing that, we like to say, I will make an excuse of why my wrong is okay. And I will keep going on that path. I will justify what it is. Or I'll say, oh, that looks familiar. It's, it's right. I'm on the right track. When we're just getting deeper and deeper into being lost. This is our struggle as people. We always try to find the quicker, easier, better route to where we want to be instead of staying on the route, the narrow path, the one that is less traveled, the one that leads us to life. Many of us have come through today in, in a storm. We had to drive through some weather. Our lives are, are filled with storms too. And if we look at it on a metaphorical way, we're going to have storms in our lives. And, and usually when that storm comes up, it's really difficult to see the path that we're supposed to be on. And when the storms come and, and it starts to rain and, and our vision is getting blurred because we're just trying to make it. We're just trying to stay above water. We start to lose sight of that path. But here's some great things and a great promise that we get to. And it comes with trusting in God. And we're going to talk about this in, in, a, in a second to get into it more. But when our lives start to get into a struggle, and when chaos starts to come, it, it's almost like Christ says, you know, keep calm. Just trust me. He starts this, this paragraph out with, don't let your, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust me. Trust in God, but also trust in me. When we're looking at this storm, and we look at how it goes, and we have a great promise that he gives us, and it's almost like every time we see one, after storm we get this nice little rainbow. A nice little sign that God is basically saying, I've, I've never left you. I've been with you the whole time. And even though you're going through a storm and you're going through a struggle, I've been holding you through it so that you can find your way through it and I will still give you that path, and I'll give you that light, and I'll give you the things that you need along the way, and I will guide you to where I want you to be. Trust me. I have more for you than you know or could ever imagine. <clears throat> if we look at the word trust, uh, I found uh, a couple of meanings for it. Trust is, somebody wrote, trust is a way of putting your confidence in somebody else knowing they won't let you down. I don't know about you, but that's really difficult to do with people. We put our trust in others. We always have that thing in the back that says, I'm cautiously putting this into your hands. I want you to earn this trust. But I think trust with God means this. I place my life into your hands knowing that you will get me where I need to go and I'll be better off for it. It also means that I will love you with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and I will give you all of my strength. It means that I will follow you and your direction in my life even when things go bad and even when things start to feel like it's going in a pretty crazy direction. See, that's not what we're taught to do. We're taught that when things get crazy or we get pushed up against the wall, we either are going to fight for it or we're going to run away. And a lot of us choose to run away because it's easier. And we'll just take a different path. <coughs> You know, there's a story that reminds me of when, when, when we start to think everything is going wrong, when we start to get caught up in, in something weird. It reminds me of this lady who was at the airport. She was sitting in the concourse waiting for her flight. She decided that she was going to go and buy a, a Kit Kat. She sat there, and as she was buying it, she saw a seat open up. And so she got all of her stuff, and she ran over to the seat so she can sit and wait for her plane. She started to hang her bags on it and lean everything on it, but hang her coat. When she finally got all settled in, she noticed that, hey, I want to eat my Kit Kat, but I can't find it. And then she looks over and sees this kind of big burly guy. 
with a Kit Kat bar. <laughs> and he opens it up, he breaks a piece, and she looks at him like, are you serious? And he just looks at her, breaks it, and starts to eat it. She's like, well, if this guy's going to have that much nerve, she reaches over and breaks a piece off and starts eating it herself. <laughs> so they go back and forth, staring each other down, serious, eating Kit Kats, <laughs> to the point where it's all gone. And he looks at her, and she looks at him. He gets up and leaves, goes by his another Kit Kat, sits back down, opens it up, starts eating it again. She <laughs> looks at him. Well, he took my whole one. I still get half of this one, too. <laughs> Breaks it up, starts to eat it. They go back and forth again until it's gone, and she's sitting there angry, and he's looking kind of like, whoa, this is weird. Her fly gets called, she gets up, picks up her purse, looks inside, sees that she still had her Kit Kat. <laughs> she realized, oh man, I just ate, just ate a whole Kit Kat from that guy. I was looking in. I thought I knew what I was doing, and, it, and this guy stole my stuff, and I was angry, and I was going to show him. And, even though we thought we were doing things right, we thought we had everything planned out, things come up, we make some choices, and we find out, ooh, my Kit Kat is still in my purse. I made a, made a mistake. We do the same thing in, in our lives, too. We start going down a path, we start getting everywhere we think we need to go. We get upset when people start taking things that we think are ours, or when our life throws things in the way that we think we shouldn't have to endure. We lose our trust that God has things pre prepared for us and planned for us. We lose sight that he has a bigger journey that we are going through because all we can see are the raindrops that are in front of us. And it starts to lose sight of what really is going on. And our trust starts to fall apart. The disciples were going through this at this time too. If we were looking back at what, what's happening for them, they're going to face a week that is insane. And I don't think any of us would have a week like this. Or maybe you have. I don't know. Here's what they were going through. It's a roller coaster of emotions that uh, basically is just starting for them. There had been joy and excitement and amazement, but what's about to come their way is fear, persecution, condemnation, bewilderment, violence, and chaos are coming just in a few hours. The week started off with Jesus coming in and people laying down leaves and he's riding on the donkey and they're celebrating him and things are looking great and they're kind of like, yes. This, this is what it's supposed to be. People are going to give us respect and joy and I feel good about myself. But just in a few days after this, everything else starts to break down. Jesus didn't want the crown that they were going to give him. He didn't want what they were expecting out of him being the Messiah. He had bigger plans. So people were shouting with praises, and they were excited that this prophet had come back, and they expected him to keep doing these miracles and, and establish his throne, but he said, that's not for me. That's not what I want. So then the crowd starts to change their view of him. Wait, I thought you were going to come and do what I wanted you to do for me, not what you knew I needed you to do for me. So now I'm going to get upset. So now the disciples are going through something even more distressing because the people who are there celebrating him are now the ones plotting for his life. And soon they're going to be in a garden seeing all of these men come to take him. But before this, they sit in an upper room and they're having a Passover feast. And even in that room, another wave of this crazy journey they're on comes up where Jesus says, one of you is going to deny me. One of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to run away. And they deny it, and they say it's not going to happen, but their hearts are just ramping up and getting kind of nervous and crazy. It's one of those things where you know everything is going to go wrong. You've ever had one of those premonitions? You're sitting there, and, and everything is okay, but you just have this feeling like, oh, I'm just waiting for stuff to go wrong. That's how they're starting to feel. And so it's no surprise that the first thing that Jesus says to them at this point is, don't let your hearts be troubled. Take a deep breath. What are you afraid of? I know you trust in God. I need you to trust in me. It sounds so simple, but it's so difficult for us to do. When the pressure comes on and we start to really feel, hey, for the first time, I'm going to have to make a choice, and it's one that I don't want to make. I can go the easy route. I can make a hard choice. 
Trust that God has you. He's holding you through it. I was told that the best way to see the character in somebody is to look at it like, like a pressure cooker. The only true way that you can see the real flavor of something is when you put pressure to it and it brings it all out. I get to see what your character is really like when the pressure is turned up. Are you going to stay trusting in God and following where He wants you to be? Or are you going to push back? So here's what He wants them to think about. Trust in me. Trust in God. There's a bigger plan for you. I have something that, it, that will last forever. So we need to look at this as an example of, of what we kind of get ourselves caught into as far as temporary things. Look around and look at the pews that you're sitting in. One day they're going to be gone. But the good news is, is, is God won't be. Christ won't be God because He doesn't dwell within these pews. He dwells within your hearts. You are where Christ dwells. It's not this building. <coughs> One day this church may be gone. And I'm going to be careful with this because the last time I said something about a fire, we lost the building. So I'm just going to say, One day this church may go. And you know what? God will still remain. He doesn't dwell within this building. Look around at, at, at all the temporary things of this life. Your car may break down. You may have a house problem. You may have so many things. Those are temporary things of this life. Christ will continue and continue to endure. And God will still live and thrive because He doesn't live in temporary things. He wants us to trust and know that He is in control. So the next part when things are getting uh, you know, a little ramped up and, and, and life is getting a little struggle and you have a hard time seeing the way he, he wants us to also be calm and trust in His promises. We have to trust and believe in His promises. And, and He gives us this part after the next scripture. And it says, There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, I would not have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way where I am going. This is our promise. When things are, are, are tough and we're struggling, he, he not only says, trust me, I'm going to get you there, but he says, I've given you a promise already. I am I'm preparing you a room. Why would I prepare a room for you if I didn't plan on coming back and bringing you there? So some of you here may have had this moment. I, I'm not quite there yet in, in, in my parenting, but I have had a parent who had this for me as well. You have kids that go away to college, and you still keep their room the way they left it, and you keep making it prepared for their needs. Some of you have not, and you said, get out of here, get rid of this, it's okay. okay. Jesus is not like you. I'm just like, I'm just no, but we have that room that is sitting there, and it's waiting for you, and it's prepared, and it's to your likings, so that when you come back, you know that you have a place. Well, Christ is going out, and he's preparing our rooms too. In the rooms that are fit for us. It's not a generic room. It's not a room with white walls. Uh, it's not like the Sochi Olympics. They have doors and handles. That's a cheap jab. That's all right. These are places that are, are meant just for you. And he looks at you and says, My father's house has so many rooms. They're not used to houses with any rooms. They're used to one room. That's what the houses look like. Back there. One big room. Um, maybe you have two and he's telling them, my father has a house with so many rooms, and, and it's for you. And I'm going there, and I'm making it for you. I'm making your bed. I'm setting it all out. I want you to know that this is a place that you will be forever. And it's promised to you because my father has called me home to get this place ready for you. And I'm still going to come back, and I'm going to bring you with me. Isn't that a great promise? Yeah. promise where you think that, I feel like he's gone. He's left me. He's never coming back. And you can see the disciples felt this way later. When Christ died, I don't think they felt like, oh, no. he's coming back, guys. Don't worry about it. That's what he said. I think they were saying, what do we do now? He's gone. The guy we followed and put everything into has left us. We need to run. We need to, they're going to come after us next. Let's lock ourselves up in a room. When things get hard and things get tough, we have a promise. And a promise that will outlast all these other things. God is making a room for us. He's preparing it. It's like an extreme home makeover. 
They take this old house that doesn't fit their needs. It may be too small. It may not have the things that their special needs child has or whatever. And they knock the whole thing down and build this giant house that fits exactly what their needs and personalities are. Sometimes a little overkill. But, but don't you think that that would be the same case in a house, in a room that God is preparing for us to? Specifically to our needs because of His love and His promise for us. And this is a promise for all who are going through tough times. To be reminded by uh, this word that God has a dwelling place for us in heaven. And he reminds his disciples of this and he tells them, you know the way. You know the way to where I am going. But they don't. They still don't get it. They've been with him for a while now and you would think that they have everything figured out because he sits with them, he talks with them, he prays with them, he explains things to them. He walks with them. He holds their hand through the process, but they still don't get it. So they ask the question that we all ask. When we're lost, we sit there and, and, and we yell, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how to get to where you want me to be. I'm lost. I'm hugging the tree and I'm blowing my whistle. I'm waiting for you to come back and get me. And he says, be calm. I am the way. Don't seek anywhere else. Keep your eyes fixed on me. I am the way. Jesus confronts his disciples in a, a passage, but, but Thomas is still not sure. And he asks that question. And Jesus says, Hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him. And have seen him. I hope that the, the light bulb has gone on this morning. Jesus is our way. He is the way that leads to truth. And his truth leads to life. And as we look and we seek him out and we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, we will find our way to where he wants us to be. There are those people in your life that you have never been able to explain how they found God because they just don't look like they should be there. Guess what? At some point in their life, God has called out to them and has called them home. And they kept their eyes fixed on Him and found their way there. And if you want, you know, personal stories, I had a friend in high school who grew up to two parents who were drug dealers and one was a gang member. The father was in jail most of his life. He was going down the same path. When high school came, his grandma said, I'm taking, I'm taking him with me. His grandma was a, a really strong believer she knew who God was for her. She knew the mistakes that she had made with her children. And she wanted him to not, not go down the same path. Freshman and sophomore year, uh, my friend really struggled. Not with academics, he was smart. He struggled with the desire. A desire to want to do good. He liked the quick things. I know that if I go out and I sell you know, the drugs that my, you know, my dad taught me how to do, that I can make money quick and I can get all the things I want. And I can do this. His grandma didn't give up on him. She kept working within him and saying, hey, there is more to life than, than the short road because if you live with a short-term mentality, you are going to live a short-term life. If you have a life that looks to the future of eternity and you are basing your decisions on eternity, you will have a life of eternal blessings. And so he struggled with this for a couple of years and something, I don't know what it was, clicked in with him junior year. And he started to change. And you wouldn't notice if you looked at him. But the good news is God doesn't base his judgment on us by how we look. I think he learned that he was forgiven and that he could have a different start and a different life. And we graduated together and he went off uh, and actually is now a lawyer and graduated from UCLA. And it's really funny because if anybody asked what he was going to be when he grew up, it was going to be jail or probably dead. And that was the life that a lot of my friends lived growing up in high school. It was the faith and the trust in a grandma who saw something bigger within her grandson that God was going to call him to do great things. And she didn't give up on him. She kept her trust and faith in God's promises. There's a Greek word that's called hodos, and it's defined as progress, 
a road going somewhere. Uh, Tenney defines way as uh, meaning a path over which one moves. The Old Testament talks about a couple of things about being the way, about being a path, about being where we're, where we're trying to go. In Deuteronomy 5.33 it says, Walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. And Deuteronomy 8.6 says, Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in His ways and revering Him. In Psalms 119.15 it says, I meditate on your precepts and I consider all of your ways. And then Isaiah 55.9, he, he does this, I think a lot of us have heard this before. As in heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You know, Christ, and God starts to give us an example of what his way means and what he wants us after and what he wants us to try to, to do here while we're here. And none of them say, Follow the yellow brick road that leads to the Wizard of Oz. Skip along the way, sing the song. It's going to be pretty. There'll be flowers and butterflies, and it's going to be great. He says, stay on my ways. Don't question me, because my ways are so much higher than your ways. And my thoughts are so much higher than your thoughts. Trust in the process. Understand that I know you better than you know yourself. In Psalms, it talks about, where David talks about, you knitted me in my, in my mother's womb. You knew all the days of my life. You wrote them in your book. You had plans for me before I was even born. Before I was even thought of. He knows our ways. He knows our truth. I'm going to end on this. A lot of us here have struggled to see the meaning that God has had for us in our lives. And we start to question His motives for us. And we say things like, if He wanted me to be this great person, why did He put these things in my life? If He wanted me to, to live a great life and bring other people to Him, why does He keep putting roadblocks up for me? When we start to ask these questions, I want you to know that you, you start to skid off the path that He has for you. Because you're questioning a God who is not putting the stumbling blocks in front of you. He's the one that's helped you maneuver around them. He's the one that when, when sin has come and attacked your way and you felt broken and you, there was no way out, He was the one that pulled you out of it and gave you that, that second chance of life, that second win. When Satan came and is trying to put up a barrier, He's the one that pushes him out of the way. Even though it hurt for the time being, you found your way back to the path. There's a lot of times when we ask, why do these things happen to us? And I think it's because God wants us to show the rest of the world how awesome it is to be a follower of Him. That even through the hard times, the hard circumstances, even through the storms that the life brings, that we can still find our way through them because we keep our eyes fixed on God. I used this example with the uh, youth group when we had our youth retreat. And I think it's something that, that's worth saying again. And Paul talks about in order for us to find our way to, to where God has promised us, which is heaven, the only way I know how to get there, because I don't have it all figured out yet, is I keep my eyes fixed on Him. And all the things that happened in the past, I leave behind me. Because if I pull them back in front, I will trip over them again. And I use this analogy of, any of you, you may not admit this, any of you ever seen one of those old 80s horror movies? Do the bad guys ever run after people? They never run after people. Do you want to know why? why? They don't have to. Because the people are always looking behind them. Do you know what happens when you're always looking behind you and you're running? You don't see what's in front of you. And you trip over it. And you fall down and then they just keep going. And, get you. Right? and this is our life. If we allow all the junk that has come up in our lives and we can't allow it to be behind us and we keep looking at it, we are always going to be tripping over the same stuff that we struggle with. And we're never going to see the true path that comes from what God is calling us to. So look at this one more time. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. There's only one way. One way to God. It's not through any of these other religions that are out there. It's not through any making yourself feel better by taking whatever you're taking, self-medicating, none of that gets you to the Father. There's one thing that gets you there. And that is relying and trusting in His promises 
and keeping your eyes fixed on who Christ is, because he is our way, which leads to a bigger truth, which leads to a life. Let's go to God pray. Dear Father, you're such an awesome God, and I thank you for giving us that, that guiding path, a guiding path to, to your kingdom. And we know who you are, and we know where you're from. And I pray that we don't lose sight of knowing that there's only one way for us to get there. And we have to do a lot of things. We have to look within ourselves and say, it's worth it. The cross was worth it for you because you knew where you were going. You said, heaven was so much greater, I can endure this cross so that others can join me too. And I pray that we look around and say, I can endure this place as well and I can live a life that glorifies you. I can live a life that that brings praise to you and that others may know of you because of my life and it'll be worth it even though it's a struggle because I know where I'm going because you have already laid the path for me. And I thank you for having our room ready and it's warm and it's prepared and some of us would love to be there now but we know that you have plans for us here. And while we're here we have a life that you've given us and I pray that we don't take it for granted but we celebrate it, that we enjoy it that we use it to, ha to bring life to others as well. What a blessing you've given us and what promises you've given us that we can't even earn or deserve. We're so thankful for the gift of your son and for him being all the things that we need him to be, especially our God and our Savior. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. If you're outside of Christ, you've been struggling, and, and you need to...